I'm John Sargent, and welcome to Argumental, a show where the hottest names in comedy debate the biggest issues facing mankind. Issues like, as petrol runs out, is enough being done to find an alternative drink for tramps? <laughs> what are cats getting up to? And is that South African runner a man or a woman? Let's put her in a throwing event and we'll soon find out. <laughs> Here to argue such burning issues and others like them are our teams. In the red corner with Marcus Brigstock this week, it's Mark Watson. <laughs> and joining Rufus Hound in the blue corner, please welcome Jack Whitehall. <laughs> OK, let's start with round one, where we debate a big issue that the finest minds of our generation have failed to settle. So it's about time we let the second-raters have a crack at it. <laughs> Tonight, the subject on the discussion is Britain's loveliest ladies. She might be the longest reigning monarch, but she's not lost touch with her people. Keep up, Queenie, is the icon of all things British. She maintains our reputation abroad by waving. And stealing. <laughs> but if there's anyone more queen-like than the queen, it's Her Majesty Helen Mirren, a national institution. She's done us proud and has a great pair of knockers to boot. <laughs> you saw them both there, but the issue I want the teams to argue over is this. Helen Mirren should replace the queen. <laughs> Supporting this statement on behalf of the red team, it's Marcus Brigstock. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, Helen Mirren should replace the Queen. Look at that stamp. Get rid of the Queen, we create one of those. Who wouldn't want to hold that in your hand and say, bend over, lady, I'm licking you from behind? <laughs> I know I would. <laughs> of course, it is slightly strange that we're debating this. It's only really that Helen Mirren played the Queen so brilliantly that this debate has come up. I mean, Tom Cruise played a manipulative, power-crazed Nazi, but in real life, that doesn't mean that he's part of a sinister, deeply unpleasant cult. <laughs> when the Queen walks into the room, we are supposed to stand to attention, something I think we'd all find easier with Helen Mirren. <laughs> She won an award as the sexiest person over 60 years old. It's a shame that that was qualified, you know, sexiest over 60 years old. That's sort of like winning politest rapist. <laughs> <laughs> when I look at Helen Mirren, like many of you, I think prime suspect. And, of course, after Diana died, I looked at Prince Philip and thought exactly the same thing. <laughs> Helen Mirren is a beautiful lady. She'd make an excellent queen. She's the same age as our host, John Sargent. Same age as you, John. Who says that men age better than women? Mm. <laughs> have, you, have, you, have you met Helen Mirren? I have. Yes? Would you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Helen Mirren should replace the queen. Vote for the red team. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. OK, next up, opposing the statement and saying that Helen Mirren should not replace the Queen, it's Jack Whitehall. <laughs> OK. I don't think for one moment that Helen Mirren should replace the Queen. Now, I'll start by admitting, sometimes the Queen gets it wrong. Her decision-making can be a little bit strange at times. Like, given her situation, I personally wouldn't have taken my husband to meet the Obamas for the first time just in case he put his foot in it. This is President Barack Obama. Oh, hello, Mr. Obama. I've got a joke for you. There's a black man and a nun in a bar. Shut up, Philip. <laughs> when people present you with some of the arguments of keeping the royal family, they do seem a little bit weird. Apparently, the royal family generate more money through tourism than the London Dungeon, Madame Two Swords and the London Eye put together. Now, at first glance, I think I know which ones I'd rather have. The London Dungeon has a bloody good gift shop. <laughs> Prince William, last time I checked, he doesn't even have a gift shop. <laughs> I don't have to pay for Madame Tussauds' airfares. I have to pay for Prince Andrew's airfares. And I can get on the London Eye. I can ride it. I can't ride the Queen. <laughs> I can't ride Prince Philip. I can't ride Prince Edward. <laughs> 
<laughs> Although it was touched on by Marcus, there is this major issue of her being sexy, which I don't think is good. The sexy queen could pose, like, quite a lot of problems. Think of the things that could happen. You'd have teenagers sat in their room, hunched double over their beds, pumping themselves into ten-pound notes, hiding one count bonnets and stamps underneath their bed so their parents can't find them. Shopkeepers <laughs> would have to keep their fifty-pound notes on the top shelves of their shops. Everyone would stop piling their money because they'd be so turned on by it. The entire economy would be devalued. It would lead to hyperinflation, and we all know what happens when you get hyperinflation, like they had in 1939. The Nazis came to power. <laughs> what I'm saying is that if you vote for that team, you are not only voting for Helen Mirren to replace the Queen, you are voting for all of the political principles of the Third Reich. <laughs> brings my argument to an end. A vote for the blue team, that is a vote for traditionalism. A vote for that team is a vote for racism. Thank you. <laughs>
That's a brilliant idea. Uh, <laughs> I wish I thought of that idea myself. It's so brilliant. Well, it's self-evident that women... It's, it's such a gamble to have both your breasts enlarged at once. Um, I'm no expert on female anatomy, but, yeah, just start with one, the middle one or whatever you want. <laughs> and, uh, see how you like it. There we are. Rufus, we should cut the cost of traffic lights by only having one colour bar. <laughs> And that way we could all live oh, as a... That's a brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I like, and I like to play by the rules. <laughs> you sound like the least sexy action hero of all time. <laughs> <laughs> rules, man. Rules. Um, that is a brilliant idea, and then we'd all see the world as if we were... And cyclists. <laughs> That's it. Well done. But who do you in the studio audience think was the best at proposing the preposterous? If you think it was Rufus, who thinks all books should be rewritten in text speak, hold up your blue card. If you think it was Mark, who thinks Britain's first nude city should be Peterborough, hold up your red card. Vote now. <laughs> Close. Not from there, again! What's <laughs> up with you people? Well, it seems that Rufus is the most convincing, so well done to the blue team. <laughs> Join us after the break when our teams will discover if genetic engineering has left this man hung like a horse. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to Argumental, the show that locks horns more often than a guard at a prison for unicorns. <laughs> right, next up is Slideshow. One member of each team will again be debating a controversial issue. But this time, I want them to illustrate their argument using a series of pictures which they've never seen before. Mark and Jack, you're up for this one. Mark, I'd like you to start by arguing that what you do in your own bedroom is nobody's business but your own. Here's your first picture. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what you do in your bedroom is nobody's business. This is the bedroom is the one area of life where, if you want to do things like that, maybe we think you shouldn't, but you should at least be able to. Whatever you want to do, whether you want to get clad like that, whether you want to use, for example, one of these. Uh, <laughs> an egg. Yes, some people might like having sex with or with the help of eggs. Do we judge them? Yes, we bloody well do. But should we judge them? No, because it's not really our business if you want to tuck into an egg while doing it, or for that matter, if you want to... <laughs> Stop! That's right. <laughs> One of the most shameful things that we do in our bedrooms is say, actually, I don't really want to have sex, I'm not very good at it, I'm tired. Once again, we don't want everyone knowing that. We don't want the people to know about our sexual failures. Or, for that matter, if your wife is actually so disgusted by you that she has one of those, a stop sign. Again, <laughs> <laughs> we've all experienced the ignominy of starting to have sex only for your wife to whip up the sign once again. <laughs> That's the sort of thing you don't want the outside world to be privy to. So, no, it is not anyone else's business, even if you were to do one of these. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, oh dear. Uh, <laughs> that's right, we should all keep a monkish vow of silence about. Um, what do you mean? Oh! <laughs> you're not the one talking about shagging with a monk on the screen. Um, <laughs> what I'm saying is, just like a Trappist monk, we should take a, a vow of silence concerning what goes on in our bedrooms. Um, and in particular, if you're having sex with a monk, you should keep that very quiet. Or should you? No, that's the sort of thing I'd like to know, but it wouldn't be my business. That's the point. We're talking about secrecy. And secrecy in sex is as important as this. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I, I think that picture shows why probably we're best off not knowing what goes on under people's bedrooms, <laughs> because it's disgusting. Some people are like, ooh, I want to watch porn with two lesbians. Not for me. Where's the excitement in watching two lesbians? I'm not involved. I may as well just watch a video of someone doing a job that I'm not qualified for. <laughs> no. And if you need it, I more proof of that. <laughs> the main depressing thing about that is how bored the man looks, really. <laughs> I just can't be bothered doing this. It's like a day at the office. So, for all sorts of reasons, ladies and gentlemen, I beg you to vote for the red team. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Jack, I'd like you to argue the opposite. But what you do in your own bedroom is other people's business. Here's your first picture. <laughs> okay. 
We need to tell people what is going on in our bedrooms. And it's a man's duty. If you're having sex, tell the world about it. If you're not, lie about it. Because that's what men do. They say that thing, if a woman tells you how many men she slept with, you're meant to double it. If a man tells you how many women he slept with, you're meant to halve it. I can proudly say, I have slept with seven women in my life. <laughs> Meaning I've slept with three women and a dwarf. <laughs> or a pre-op transsexual. <laughs> or a pre-op transsexual dwarf. <laughs> it was the latter. <laughs> what I'm saying, a very fat pre-op transsexual dwarf. <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is that we shouldn't judge. That's important as well. We shouldn't judge what people do in their bedroom. We should be open to it. You know, who says maybe Rufus likes a bit of very simple winkle dinkle in foo action when he gets into his bedroom. <laughs> maybe Marcus prefers to be dangled from the ceiling in a harness wearing women's suspenders with a leash around his neck and a clementine in his mouth whilst he's wearing two rent boys as gloves and uh, tromboning a ferret <laughs> in his mouth. And having so much stuff shoved up his ass that it leaves his anus looking like a wheelie bin. <laughs> we... <laughs> should not say... But that slack bumhole gentleman there is, is bad for necessarily doing that. Because the more we talk about it, the more likely we are going to be able to do kinky stuff. Because kinky stuff's great. Like role play, that's brilliant. Whether it's, you know, doctor and nurse or, you know, even more inventive ones like a uh, farmer and... <laughs> <laughs> And, and, uh, and, like, neo-Nazi gay. The, uh, <laughs> isn't that weird as well? Bald men like that. It's, like, either, like, really gay or really racist. Uh, never both. I hate Jews, but I love Abba. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> what I'm saying is that what goes on behind my bedroom door, I am proud of, and I want to tell the world about it. I am proud to put up my hand and say that my thing is... <laughs> <laughs> Getting off to Morecambe and Wise. <laughs> so, yeah, bear in mind that when you vote for the blue team. Then a vote for the blue team is a vote for, like, being sexually debauched. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Marcus and Rufus, would either of you like to pitch anything into this debate? Well, uh, your term winkle dinkle foo foo I find confusing. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'm not as young as I used to be, but can you elaborate on that? I'll give it to you simple, Mark. The... when a man loves a woman... Do it. <laughs> this is rather embarrassing, because you forced me to admit that I... Little finger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, look at you. What are you, nine, ten years old, Jack? <laughs> uh, you're sort of lithe and wiggling about all over the place. That's depressing. It I'm is. 36. I'm married. We've got two children. I've had sex twice. <laughs> but what's the, what's the contention that, you know, what goes on in the bedroom is sacrosanct? Yeah, but it just means that people take it, well, I have these next-door neighbours, and all, the, the role-plays became unbelievable. It was like, you know, I'm a dolphin, you must catch me in this net, but be careful because of EU fishing restrictions. Yeah. You think, <laughs> you know, can't we just have sex? You don't have to go on Wikipedia <laughs> beforehand, you know. Like, <laughs> Thank you. So, is what you do in your own bedroom anybody else's business? It's a red card for Mark and Marcus, who need their privacy, and a blue one for Jack and Rufus, who are happy to let it all hang out. Vote now. Oh, I've just got a... I've just got a real waft of sympathy. Mm. <laughs> OK, it's a victory for the Reds. Well done, Mark. <laughs> You've convinced the audience that what you do in your own bedroom is nobody's business but your own. What goes on in my bedroom is my own business, and a very successful business it is, too. There are a lot of rich, lonely women out there. <laughs> it's on now to our popular culture round, where tonight's debate is about a subject which is getting everyone's genomes in a twist. Genetic engineering. So, is it really a good idea to be meddling with nature? Let's find out with the help of tonight's special guest. From Biotech UK's Research and Development Department, please welcome Barry. Welcome to the show, Barry. Barry is the culmination of ten years of research into genetic engineering. 
and has been created by combining the back half of a stallion with the front half of a stallion. <laughs> You're up first, Marcus. Barry Marcus. <laughs> What I want you to argue, Marcus, is that genetic engineering is great. Yeah, just uh, one second, if you don't mind, John. Sure. We spend five minutes arguing that what happens in the bedroom stays in the bedroom, <laughs> and then you turn up. <laughs> Com completely undermine my argument. <laughs> Look at this, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this is the result of a project that I have funded into genetic engineering, and I have to say, we're both very happy, aren't we, Barry? Oh, yes. <laughs> we could all benefit from genetic engineering. Now that we have forged the way with Barry here and the remains of red rum... <laughs> We could all benefit. Rufus, you could have your follicles worked on so that you could grow a man's beard. <laughs> Even I could have a little bit of work done and have my hideously long head crushed into a normal human size so that I look less like Beaker from The Muppets. <laughs> Jack here... Jack could have those ridiculously thin hips fused with some stilton so that he could wear normal trousers <laughs> like an adult man. <laughs> Mark here is Welsh. <laughs> Anyone who tells you genetic engineering is not the way forward is anti-science. That's what you're going to hear from these people over here. These are people that will stand outside a greenhouse in November going, oh, tomatoes in November! It's not natural, no! <laughs> a level of fear shared only with the Amish. <laughs> I believe them to be Amish. Their idea of a good time is raising a barn, riding around on carts and having sex with their sisters. Well, I've had sex with your sisters and it ain't all that. <laughs> Right, Barry? <laughs> we can improve on nature. We have improved on nature. Vote for Barry, vote for me, vote red. Thank you. <laughs> well done, Marcus. Rufus, you're up next. Meet Barry. First, I think, a song. <laughs> <laughs> I like big butts and a can of lie. <laughs> Centaur, do the dance! <laughs> uh, genetic engineering. That is quite something. I, uh, I think I've seen in one of my specialist magazines. Uh, I think he was the centaur fold. <laughs> oh, <laughs> piss off. <laughs> so, Rufus, you're arguing against Marcus and Barry and saying that genetic engineering is not great. No, it very clearly is not great. I just don't think that we should trust any experiment that starts with the phrase, I'm going to need a human fetus. <laughs> just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. I mean, I could find out where Jeremy Kyle lives. I could buy a gun, but... <laughs> if you do that, I got your back, and so's Barry here. <laughs> <laughs> Barry would speak, but he can't. He's a little horse. <laughs> Not so little. <laughs> <laughs> Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. I think we've all seen those pictures of the monkeys with the electrodes in the head. Well, that's all very impressive, but it is inherently evil, and I turn my eyes away from it. You know what science brought us? I remember a time when science told us they wanted to dig a channel under the tunnel. Or a tunnel... <laughs> <laughs> channel. Channel under the channel. Amazing technology. Tunnel under the channel. <laughs> Much more difficult than the original project. Yeah. 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 What, what did that channel under that channel tunnel bring us? <laughs> Nothing but vampires and tuberculosis. <laughs> yeah, just because science has allowed it to be doesn't mean we should appreciate it. Jar Jar Binks. Just because science can do it doesn't mean it has any place in the world. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure it's racist. <laughs> Vote for the blue team. Thank you.
Thank you, Rufus. Mark and Jack, would you like to add anything in support of your teammates? I think if you offered most people <laughs> the choice between a centaur <laughs> or, at the very least, what would happen if Camilla Parker Bowles and Charles ever do mate? <laughs> <laughs> One advantage, though, of having designer babies is that all the babies would be really, like, you know, they'd grow up to be nice, handsome children and stuff, and then you'd have no bullying in schools, which is good because bullying is really bad, and I'm never, I hate bullying. That's why I yeah. bought one of those. I bought one of those anti bullying bands when they first came out. So. I say bought, I started off a fat ginger kid. But. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. So, is genetic engineering great? Once again, the studio audience will decide who made the best case. It's a red card for Marks and Mark, who think genetic engineering is great. And a blue one for Rufus and Jack, who believe that Barry is an abomination against God and nature. <laughs> Nothing personal, Barry. <laughs> Vote now. Yes, Barry, I want you to know that vote is for you. <laughs> Beautiful half man, half horse thing. So, it's a win for the Reds. Well done, Marcus and Mark. They convince the audience that genetic engineering is great. Unfortunately, we have to say goodbye to Barry now, as he has to return to the lab to be dissected. <laughs> Barry, everybody. <laughs> Many people are worried about the implications of genetic modification of crops. There is no proof that this process has any adverse effects, said one carrot. <laughs> At the end of that round, Marcus and Mark, Rufus and Jack are neck and neck. <laughs> Time now for the final round, and a last chance for our teams to show just how argumental they really are. I'm going to show them a series of images. All they have to do is suggest what argument the picture is proving. OK, teams, here's your first one. <laughs> is this an argument for if you have a problem with the noise of my helicopter, then shut the fucking window? <laughs> That's an argument against Madonna going on her world tour without makeup. <laughs> <laughs> is this an argument that there are only so many things you can do to drown out the sound of your kids saying the sentence to you, Mum, we're taking you to a home? <laughs> Next one. This is an argument that if you're drunk, it's very hard to say, Holly Willoughby's wobbly wallaby. <laughs> This is an argument that um, all of uh, uh, Steve Irwin's co-stars are finding it really hard to come to terms with his death. <laughs> <laughs> OK, next one. It seems like an argument against nipping out for a fag after dinner. <laughs> is this an argument for things like this occurring outside of the UK? Cos if this happened in the UK, we'd have David Blaine syndrome, where if something like that happens, you're like, oh, look, an installation that's going to put us on the cultural map. You get the eggs, I'll shit in a bag. <laughs> 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 OK, that's it. So, for one last time, it's down to our studio audience to decide who made the best case. Red for Marcus and Mark, and blue for Rufus and Jack. Vote now. <laughs> so, I can tell you, by a whisker, the blue team have won the round, which means this week's winners are the blue team. Well done, Rufus Hand and Jack Whitehall. Commiserations to Marcus Brigstock and Mark Watson. That's all we've got time for. Good night. And there's more brand new Argumental next Tuesday night at the same time. By the way, for exclusive Argumental outtakes, of which there are quite a few, and behind-the-scenes clips, head to joindave.co.uk.